Hi, it's the Filmmakers Forum at Kapow, where police have as our guest this afternoon, Jim Ojala. Uh, no, Jim personally, he's done some special effects for us. Uh, hi, Jim. Hi. Hey. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about how you um, got into the, broke into the business of uh, special effects? Um, well, I'm from Duluth, Minnesota, where me and my friends were, you know, discovering public access television and, um, you know, taking the courses and started to make our own short films and then created this uh, horror comedy series called My Three Scums on public access. And My Three Scums? A lot of new my Three Scums, yes. Okay, it's kind of like the monsters on crack, you know? <laughs> so it was this family of monsters that, uh, that kind of stuck together and, and lived together and got back at society um, in very humorous and gory, uh, offensive ways. Um, but we had a ton of fun. That's how I discovered my love of filmmaking. And um, we got a lot of attention in our hometown, both love and hate. And, and uh, it was very fascinating. And uh, I, I, I knew there was somewhere else to go, but I didn't know where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, filing medical record charts and being the maintenance man at night, just so I can have enough money to make my crappy short films on the weekends, you know, <laughs> um, doing what I really love. So I send a copy. I get the biggest computer box I can find, enormous. Put a copy of our best episode of My Three Scums in the box with a letter to Lloyd Kaufman of Troma Entertainment. Oh. It was a big inspiration. And there's all this room left over in the box. So I fill the rest with helium balloons that all say, like, I love My Three Scums and everything. And then we put flyers of the show and stuff in it and uh, send it to Lloyd. And a month later, I get a letter from him saying, oh, thank you for the box and the balloons and everything. And uh, you're a really talented filmmaker. And if you're ever in Hell's Kitchen, New York, we'd love to meet with you. And it was like, I mean, from the t at that time, like, I mean, it's, that's from the gods, you know? Like, I, for, from where I come from, like, working in the entertainment industry isn't even planet Earth, like, not even remotely. Um, so, and, you know, that's why we sent the big box, because we figured, like, a company like that, they'd probably get fans sending them crap all the time. So, the first step is make sure you stand out somehow. If you don't have, if you don't have any hype behind you, you need to physically stand out somehow. So that that worked for us. Um, so I instantly book a trip out to New York. Um, I show up on Troma's doorstep in Hell's Kitchen, New York. Lloyd, to his credit, drops everything, and I sit down with him in his office for like a half an hour. We hit it off. He invites me to come out that summer and intern on their next film, which is Citizen Toxic, Toxic Avenger Part 4. Oh, wow. I, I'm a massive Toxic Avenger fan. So it was like, whole, like I couldn't <laughs> even believe, like, and you know, and, and this is just to intern for free. Um, but still, you, you, you see the potential. There's, there's an opportunity there. So I instantly go back to Minnesota, quit my job, cash out my savings, and I you know, show up in New York to uh, you know, live on some guy's dining room floor. Um, and uh, basically the second, I, I started out in the, in the uh, production office at Troma, trying to score them uh, product placement, getting them free toilet paper, stuff like that, having people yell at you because you're trying to like basically ask private companies for their product for free in exchange for credits. So a lot, <laughs> a lot of companies aren't thrilled by that. Um, but well, Jim, what, what was your biggest get on the, uh, on the product placement? Um, I did, I did, I did, I had, uh, I, I got close to getting free ice, but the guy ended up screaming at me that how am I going to, he's like in Brooklyn, he's like, how in the hell am I going to pay my guys with credits? And I was like, oh, okay, I, I, never mind, never mind. But I did score uh, the entire production. I got them free toilet paper. That's so huge. In exchange for credits and product placement, I got free toilet paper for, you know, and that, and that was a, we had a giant cast and crew on Citizen Toxie. So that wow. toilet paper came in, came in very handy. To, 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 just imagine if you had done that during the pandemic, if you did that like, like April, you would have been like King. He got toilet paper. Of course, that wasn't uh, during the pandemic, yeah, but that was. Then people would be begging to work on your movie for free. <laughs> you got the I'll do it for free. Just let me come on and use your toilet paper. Wow. Exactly. You guys got to shoot. Exactly. See, if you can think ahead, you know. Um, oh, wow. Well. So second day on the job, they announced that there is an opening in the special makeup and creature effects studio that's working on the film in Brooklyn. And is there anybody that's interested? And I'm, I'm the first one to get my hand up. 
yes, please get me out of this hell hole and get me over to, the, to make, I don't want to make any more of these torturous phone calls. And um, I show up on Tim Considine and direct effects uh, doorstep in Brooklyn. And um, Tim takes me under his wing as his intern. Um, you know, we had, there was a whole like gang working on the film, but uh, he took me under his wing, taught me everything from the ground up. He was a Dick Smith student. So he knew about all the old school methods of how things were done. And um, basically we did the movie. And before the movie was even over, Tim had offered me a full-time assisting position um, in his studio. So right away when the movie was over, I'm, I'm working with him on Larry Fessenden's Wendigo. Um, I'm working on like Broadway stuff, uh, Rolling Stone covers. Um, just, it kind of started at a mount. Rolling Stone and, covers, wow. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, we did. I, I, one of my first jobs was making fake teeth for uh, uh, Ben Stiller for uh, when, when Tim put him in this like caveman um, makeup that was in Rolling Stone. Um, so yeah, he did a bunch of stuff with like Mark Seliger and David LaChapelle and all these amazing photographers. Um, so it was, it was a, and, and at that time, like it's a much bigger universe now, but at that time um, there wasn't, there wasn't many players in the game in New York. It was like Tim and like a couple other guys. Otherwise there wasn't much competition because it was mostly it was it was a hard time to stay alive because you were either if you were working in special effects at that time in New York you were you're going to be on Saturday Night Live or you're going to be waiting for you know trauma to call or you're going to have independent filmmakers calling you up wanting to do exploding heads for fifty dollars you know I mean it was it was very difficult it was very barren wow wow yeah. so you went from a kid in Minnesota doing some movies have a, have passion for that have the idea of putting uh your best film in a uh healing balloons in a box and did, did, did you mail it or did that yeah, go with mail the mail, mail oh. it. Yeah. and then that got this attention so i mean talk about dreams and talk about being a little bit of uh, uh imagine use your imagination to figure out what you want you try things i mean nothing nothing works and everything works you know so it's like there's no rules to anything try any stupid thing that doesn't get you arrested, you know? And sometimes you should try the things that get you arrested. You know? If it's worth it, man, exactly, exactly. Wow. Um, you've been around special effects a lot. What, what, what makes you go wow when you, when you see something um, in a theater or you see a production? What, 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 what's, what's, what, do you, what do you admire in other, other special effects? I mean, the thing is so many effects, so many bad effects can be hidden in quick cuts and editing, um, tricks, VFX saves, all these things. But um, when I, like, I'll tell you, one film that I saw recently that just blew my mind was the Swedish film Border. Have you seen it? I have not, no. It's, it's wild. It's unlike anything you've ever seen. And see it, but don't, don't read about anything about it before you see it. Because it's, it, it, it's very, it's just, it's bizarre, but so well done. Well, there's a main character in there that has, you don't know if she's part animal or if this is a deformity, but in, I mean, the main character that's in every single scene of the movie, the whole movie's about her and she has an entire full face prosthetic or a series of prosthetics. And I mean, they have, they have close-ups on her like that, that linger for long periods of time. And I mean, I know what I'm doing, but I was like, damn, I cannot, I can't see a seam anywhere. I can't see even the suggestion of a prosthetic. I mean, masterfully done. When you can get up that close on something and see it and it can linger with no cuts and that, and that convinces you that I'm hugely, hugely impressed. Like the movie Wonder too with a little kid with the, the, with the, with the face and head deformity. Right. And Kren, he's also like in every scene of the movie and uh, the, the makeup effects on that, I think they should have won the Oscar for that because it was just phenomenal. And to do that on a little kid, you know? That's hard even to do. Yeah. So, well, so, so you went from uh, Minnesota to New York and then um, how'd you get out to California? Um, basically after 9-11, uh, I mean, you couldn't even get temp jobs in New York. I mean, it was, it was wrecked. It was bad. Um, and you had continual threats of, you know, I mean, you'd walk through the streets and there'd be SWAT team members on the roofs and 
you know, the Empire State Building is going to blow up the next week and no productions were happening anytime soon. So I go to New York or I go to LA on a visit and um, in less than a week through Lloyd, he, Lloyd and my mentor, Tim, um, Tim was already in New York or LA at that time. He had already moved. And they said, hey, look at this guy, Rob Hall in Almost Human. I think it's an effects shop out there. Um, and on the referral of both of those guys, I, I contact this guy, Rob Hall. And sure enough, he does have a effects shop and he just got Angel and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And based on the recommendation of Tim and Lloyd, he gives me a shot to start working for him with his crew. And, uh, and this is a much bigger thing now that I'd ever worked on. So I was kind of out of my element. So I kind of started almost at the ground level all over again. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the new fish in town, so I get it. It's, it's fine, you know. And, um, and they kind of taught me the ropes, how things were done in L.A. And, and then Buffy and Angel led to Firefly and several other movies. And, um, and then at that point, I'm just, I'm then working into bigger shops, working on things like Where the Wild Things Are, Jim Henson's, or Hellboy 2, um, and uh, X-Men 3 at Spectrum Motion and getting to work at bigger studios and really getting my feet wet on how different technicians and artists do their work in the industry. And that basically started to give me the knowledge and the confidence to start going out on my own, taking my own side gigs. Right, so uh, what, I mean, so going from Minnesota to New York to Los Angeles, working for the people, then you made the leap of faith to you, another leap of faith to your own, doing your own, on your own uh, projects yeah yeah because like i mean i i knew that i i needed both money wise and just artistically if you're working in a bigger studio a lot of times you're just doing one thing and that's it you might sit in that corner and just work on a scene or hair work or work on an eyeball for you know a week or whatever right. you know um and you know I get a little antsy. I want, I'm, I'm good at several different aspects and I want to flex those muscles. So by starting to take my own side gigs just out of my one car garage back then um, allowed me to make a little more money having side gigs and because you can get to make your own deal. And then, um, and then also I got to do everything plus go on set. Cause that's the other, that's the other downside to working at bigger studios sometimes is that a lot of the guys that make, the, the, the actual practical effects, they never go to set. So they're stuck in the warehouse working on this stuff all the time. And then a whole nother team goes to set. And, that, and that'll, that'll get frustrating and it'll really piss you off if let's say you make a puppet and you worked really hard and you made this amazing puppet. And then all of a sudden the studio has some other SAG puppeteer grab that puppet and go to set and make a ton of money. And even though you made it. So oh, wow. all those things could get kind of frustrating. Um, so I like the idea of being just my own commander, you know, um, you know, and live and die by my own, uh, you know, rules and direction. So the first movie that really did that for me was Dead Girl. Uh, it was an indie film that I took on, um, and I knew it wasn't a lot of money, it wasn't a lot of time, but I knew it was going to be done really well, and. Sure enough, it blew up at the Toronto Film Festival. I flew out. I was part of it there. It was, it was a whole happening. I got in Fangoria. I mean, all of a sudden, I started to be known as Jim Dead Girl Ojula. And because of the success of that film, that allowed me to get more referrals for my own side gigs, eventually leading to me opening my own studio. Right. Wow. And probably understanding every part of filmmaking from the very, very beginning of trying to uh, get toilet paper for the cast and crew to yeah. keep on moving every time you made a lateral above up that probably made you a better filmmaker and for the whole I, i'm sure that helped if you understand every part about how to make a film you're better on the set yeah absolutely absolutely i mean like that's why i i, I always recommend if somebody hasn't worked on a feature yet um if you can if check with trauma if trauma is making a new feature try to get in there as an intern because it will make or break you You'll learn something about every aspect because they shoot for long periods too. I mean, they have like six week shoots. I mean, that's crazy for Insane, independent huh? film shooting for six weeks. I mean, we were averaging, in, especially in the makeup effects department, we were averaging 20 hour days 
you know, with maybe three hours of sleep because we had to be the first ones on set, making up the Toxic Avenger, getting effects ready, and the last ones to leave, taking them out of the makeup for hours while everybody else is leaving. And um, I saw it break a lot of people. I saw a lot of people just crumble. So if you can make it through that, you literally can make it through anything. I've been doing this for over two decades now, and I have not seen anything anywhere near as challenging as working on a trauma film. Well, through fire with trauma, now your anything else is kind of cake, it sounds like. You can handle almost anything. Kind of, yeah. Like if, if yeah, wow. if you're still standing, yeah. <laughs> right. Now, now, Kapow has a lot of independent filmmakers. Uh, I think a lot of these, some of these films we have to see this this time are, in Kapow 5 are amazing. Um, but a lot of the filmmakers were working under lower budgets, uh, totally independent, or maybe SAG ultra low budget. You have somebody that has a film, they want special effects, and let's say they don't have a lot of money in the budget, but a lot of times they really want to make the special effects scene because the special effects make a better film. What kind of things can they do that's inexpensive that looks really good on screen? Um, I, I would say the, the first thing, you know, a, lot of, a lot of filmmakers kind of make the mistake of not having the budget but or the time frame, but still cramming a bunch of effects in their scripts. And it's bad because we have a saying in the, in the effects industry, you, and sometimes you can have it fast, cheap, and good. The, those are the three things. Those are the three options. You can have all three. Fast, cheap, and good. Okay. Yeah. You can have all three. Sometimes you can have two, but you can have all three. Pick which ones you want. So- that just just that lesson will kind of pave the road for what you can and can't do. Um, because if you, I'll tell you right now, if you don't have the budget for it or the time frame, if you try to cram a bunch of effects in your film, even if you can get an effects guy that'll agree to it, these will be a bunch of half-ass effects that'll be mediocre at best. You'll probably have to cut half of them out um, or, or kind of cheat them, cut away really fast. Um, uh, try to do implied uh, scenes with it um, because it's just uh, it's just not practical. Like it, the, the best thing you could do um, is to cherry pick, cherry pick like two, three really standout moments where it's like, okay, put your resources into those few moments and make those really good. That's why Dead Girl was successful in terms of the practical effects and it really affecting the audience because it was already about pretty intense um, controversial subject matter. So, and that's a conversation I had with those filmmakers and we decided on just a handful of a few effects. And when those come up on screen, they're so damn effective that they just make the audience squirm and they work really well, rather than if we just spread a bunch of stuff around, um, not only, even if they were really good, you start to lose your impact after a while. So it's kind of like, oh, another great effect, another great effect. Well, by the time you get to the fifth great effect, it's kind of like, cool, you know? <laughs> but it's like, if you only have like three of those and they're spaced out enough uh, and you really, you really make an impact, you know? Um, so, you know, and, and as far as like the, um, the specific effects that can be on a lower budget, I mean, you're, you're talking about things like um, you could do a really good slit throat on a fairly small budget because you would have a bladder that would be put underneath a prosthetic and the prosthetic, all that stuff can already be attached on the actor and you put the blade in and, oh, and as the actor like falls back, it starts bleeding. And then as the, the knife goes, it reveals the slit. And if, if, it, if it's a good enough uh, prosthetic, the actor can actually open up and then it looks like the opening of the slit is opening up too and more blood comes out. Something like that's a fairly inexpensive thing. Um, you know, inserts, um, when you can do cutaways and inserts to like fake bodies where things are happening, that's, uh, that's fairly um, inexpensive. Exit wounds, sometimes we'll just want like an exit wound splatter. And we developed this thing called the brain blaster, which- brain, is, What is it, the brain blaster? The brain, brain blaster, yeah. It's, it's, it's just instant fun. Um, it was basically reverse engineering 
a, a drain blaster for clogs in your tub and taking them and, uh, and basically flipping the, the, uh, the, the, the end of the gun, flipping that around and sticking PVC in it. And then you air up this gun just by hand. And then you fill the PVC tube at all different sizes with you know, bananas and blood and stuff like that. Aim it wherever you want. Sometimes you can be behind the actor and have it aimed at the wall just the right, and then bam, you pull it and it's almost like a CO2 cartridge and just splat. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's great. And you can pressurize it to whatever amount of splat you want. Something like that's just for a quick thing is really effective and costs like next to nothing. Um, and then also just, just knowing little like, um, little aesthetics of like, uh, if you're having a creature or a puppet, nine times out of 10, you will make that look a lot more real on screen if you just make it look wet. Just make it look wet. Wow. Just slime it up, just put some KY on it. Instantly, it can make something that looks kind of fake and rubbery look really real. Wow. It's just little things like that, you know, knowing th about elements like ultra slime. Ultra slime is something that was developed in 1984 for gremlins and ghostbusters. And you can get that from different special effects houses. And it's a slime that's, that's clear, it's translucent, but it stretches and stretches and it won't break. You have to actually cut it with scissors, but it's so effective to put in the creature's mouth or to have it be fake snot or, you know, for, you know, uh, uh, some kind of sea monster and it's stretching from him as his arms are going up. Like it's something that you can just buy a bucket of it and put it on anything and you can tint it any color you want to. Something like that instantly improves your production value. So, wow. wow, amazing. So, so the slime and the bananas for brains and a little blood, you, yeah. you can, you can make pretty much, it's, it's a magic. It's, yeah. But, you know, I've seen a lot of films and you got some that are, uh, you know, uh, um, SFX and it's really special effects and some that are uh, CGI. What are your thoughts on the two? Are you using the two? Are they complimentary or what, what, what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think they're super complimentary. I mean, uh, there's a lot of effects guys that freaked out that, you know, after Jurassic Park came out, like, oh, you know, our, our job is over and it's done. Nobody's going to ever want us again. And luckily, things have leveled out now where a, a lot of audiences don't really dig fully generated CG characters, creatures, whatever. Um, so when we can combine, and there's th things in our practical world, we can't do everything. So the CG can help us take it to another level or things like just, you know, rod removal, you know, like if you could do, um, you know, sometimes it's about like calculating the, uh, the costs. Like for instance, if you're going to have an animatronic baby that you're holding and it, and that baby moves its arms and it does all these things, well, for me to make all the mechanics for that and to put servos in that is very expensive. But on your end, as the filmmaker, what might be less expensive is if you let me just make basically like a rubber or silicone baby that looks great and has some pick points in its arms where we can put little green screen rods and then have it move around and do all that stuff and then just have your VFX supervisor remove it digitally, which is a fairly simple thing to do now. So instead of us doing all the mechanics, you could save a lot of money by going that route. And then you get the best of both worlds still. Great. What, which, what's what one of your um, effects that you're most proud of? Oh, um, there's a... Uh, I mean, there was one in Dead Girl that was that was great with the, uh, there was some old like bullet wounds in her that were festering and some really gross stuff happens. And I mean, I almost got sick just looking at it when I was there on set and then, and then seeing how an audience reacted to it just on a much smaller level, that was, um, that was really satisfying. Um, we did a really cool Dagon creature for the HP Lovecraft's The Deep Ones recently that uh, it was a full creature suit, mechanical head with glowing eyes. Uh, that was awesome. Um, my favorite thing that we've ever done is probably the animatronic two-headed mutant wolf that we made for Strange Nature. It's just, 
a killer puppet. A lot, a lot of people, it says it reminds them of Rob, some of Rob Bottin's effects and Stan Winston's effects and, and the thing. And it's just, uh, it's so, it's so cool. In fact, that's, that's a painting of right there of it. Uh, oh, wow. That, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that uh, Amber, um, Amber Marie did for me. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my favorite personal thing. Um, and then we had things that, you know, we did have a melting Trump head that, you know, became kind of infamous. Um, uh, working on a, on a studio level, my favorite thing by far was working on Where the Wild Things Are at Jim Henson's Creature Shop. Because for like six, seven months, you know, that was my favorite book growing up. And we're creating their suits and the giant heads. And, and it, you, you have this memory of what it was like looking at those bizarre characters as a kid. And then to see them come to life from sculpture to molds, to the paint shop, to the eyes right in front of you. Um, and just, and there was so much artist support and positive attitudes at that studio too. Um, it was just by far my favorite experience of working on a big film. Wow, to be there. And some of us like you were like, uh, at Santa's toy shop, finally, you, you, you little kid that finally made it up to where they make the toys oh, for Christmas. Absolutely, and then there'd be times where, you know, it was in the summer, so people are getting hot and, you know, we're working really hard and we just blow off some steam and go in the parking lot and have a water balloon fight, like in the middle <laughs> of the day. Or maybe we'd have a margarita party or whatever. We were like having a good time, but work was still getting done. Like people need to remember that sometimes. Like there's no reason you have to be like just stressed out and pissy all the time when, when there's a lot of work to do. Like there is a way to have a good time too. You know? You could be working in a, a highway somewhere, or a roofer, and not have a lot of fun. It's still hard work, but it's still That's stress. Cool. But last year we were working a long day in, in the in the effects shop, and there's a few few uh, people in there working with me, and and you know I, I know we were doing some, we were doing some stuff that wasn't that fun, and I was like, hey, look, whatever you guys think, I just want you to look out there, and you see that group of guy guys that's in the hot sun right outside our door, working on repaving the blacktop in our in the in the complex and it's like we could be doing that so you know just yeah. always take stock of that you know that you're very lucky to be doing any part of this you know when you make film you really it's hard work you get a pay it's not a lot of pay but you do have some you're doing you you're doing your passion you're, you're living your life so who would give it up yeah um, exactly uh, and how, how, how long were you with Lloyd Kaufman? I'm sorry, what was that? How long were you, were you with Lloyd Kaufman? Oh, um, so I, uh, well, I worked on, um, I worked on Citizen Toxie with Lloyd and then um, he, he talked to me about doing Poultrygeist and, um, and it was, and I loved the script. It was a great, hilarious script. Um, but I, I wasn't able to go back. I, I was already in LA at the time. I couldn't go back to New York for it. So I, I made like the creature uh, zombie chicken puppet that comes out of the toilet in the film, which he said he was pissed how, how expensive it was. But he did say that um, it always gets like a, a standing ovation or whatever at every screening. So I'm sure, I'm sure. I know I love the story about the uh, balloons um, in the in the computer box with your, with your film. Any other stories about Lloyd that's was Kind of... Yeah, yeah. I mean, Lo I mean, Lloyd's one of the. He's he's one of my favorite people, and he's also one of the most, you know, <laughs> eccentric. Um, you know, most energetic. I mean, at, at his age now, I think he's in his seventies, and he's got more energy than almost anybody I know. I mean, when we were on Toxie, you know, I mean, he he would he never ever. He was older than anybody on set. Never run out of energy, and we started to realize like, you know, every time we would break for lunch, and these were crappy lunches too. It was like bad food. And I remember like, luckily it, it, that's a, another thing I would say, like start with them if you've never worked on a movie before, because if you get pampered and then go to trauma, you're going to get pissed and freak out. Like you need to go with no expectations. Right. Like I, I didn't realize there was any such thing as craft services or anything. So I worked on it. And in the morning there's like, oh, there's a crew of like, you know, 40 people. And there's a, a, like a little bit of burnt coffee in a coffee pot and a garbage bag, literally a garbage bale bag of rock hard bagels. 
they would basically go to local bakeries and pull them out of their dumpsters. Um, and then that was, and that was the breakfast for the crew. And, uh, and there'd be like a giant jar from like Costco or something of like peanut butter, but it was empty. So <laughs> people would have to like break apart their rock hard bagel and stick their hand in the peanut butter jar and scrape the bagel on the sides to get a little something. <laughs> and oh that's my perfect. God. And that's, your, and, but to me, I was like, cool. Where I come from, jobs never gave you free food. So that's that's a plus. It looks pretty good. Yeah. Well, I was thinking during COVID, if anybody that craft service know, be, you know, everybody puts their hand in a big bowl of uh, <laughs> oh my God, different. Yeah, yeah. peanut butter. It's like, that would it work? Man, yeah, so, totally different. Yeah. Um, that's so cool that you start off so low expectations and not anything else. Oh, my, we actually get a, I get a bottle of water. Are you kidding me? That's, thank you. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's huge. And what we noticed that, that Lloyd never ate. Like, how does, this, how does this older guy have all this energy and act like a maniac nonstop, um, but, and be screaming and just like a hundred miles an hour, but he never eats. And, um, and then we found out from some of the crew that he would go to a diner late at night by himself and have all these plates of food and gorge himself <laughs> and eat once a day when no one's around. So supposedly the tactic is that never eat around your crew. So you make them feel guilty about eating so that they get back to work faster. <laughs> you know? so, so if you see the leader, the leader's already making notes and, and working on the shot list and, and wanting to get back to work. It, it makes you kind of feel bad about eating. So, oh, okay, well, maybe they'll, maybe your crew will finish 15 minutes early and start getting back to work, you know? So oh, it's, wow. yeah, I mean, it, there's all kinds of crazy tactics. Um, That's brilliant. But, but Lloyd, Lloyd was uh, an amazing um, film mentor too. And just like a lot of people would complain about not being paid or not being paid enough, but sometimes you need to know about what else um, you can you can attain from somebody. Um, like it's not all about the money. Like they they help after Citizen Toxie, I became friends with Lloyd, and I held a publicity event in Minnesota for to for my movie Strange Nature to kind of start getting the word out, and I did it by holding the Minnesota premiere of Citizen Toxie. Um, Lloyd sent out the thirty five millimeter prints at no charge. To, to, to screen and for me to hold it and to keep all the money for my publicity event, all free nice. of charge just as a favor to me because he believed in what I was doing. So sometimes relationships are worth more than just making a few bucks, you know? You, you oh, gotta think about the bigger picture, you know? Yeah, absolutely, you gotta have that. Uh, Jim, uh, you know, this is Kapal and we're virtual this year, but we actually have DeLorean in the, uh, in the Galaxy Lobby. And this, this uh, DeLorean can take you back in time, anywhere you want to go in the history of film. Ooh. And I'm going to take you to any set or you can work with any director or actors you want to work with. Who would that be? Oh, man. Um, I pr probably, oh, man, it's, that's a tough one. One of the top ones, if I could go back on the set of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre with Toby Hooper in witness that madness firsthand because that's the first movie that that like really haunted me where it 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 didn't feel like a movie it felt like there's no way these are actors these are just a bunch of weirdos that they found and they're doing this really messed up stuff in this movie and it kind of showed me the power of that in cinema so to to be able to witness that firsthand and just see how toby hooper operated with people um i think would be amazing um also to, to go back and work with um, God, I mean, Taxi Driver, to work with Scorsese during those beginning years. And those those 70s. Films. Oh, wow. Incredible. Uh, Todd Browning, to go back and work with Todd Browning, especially on something like Freaks, and to see how that, and, and just, just to see the, the balls on that guy, to, to make this movie that nobody wanted and basically got him, I mean, he was an A-list director after Dracula. And that blacklisted him. That ruined his career. But, you know, and, 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 so, and so wrongfully because like the, the, the freaks were the heroes of the film. They did creepy things, but they were essentially the heroes. So like, there's no reason that should have been seen as a bad thing. Um, but people are very uncomfortable seeing, you know, 
people that were different. Uh, um, and then actor wise, I mean, James Cagney is one of my favorites. Um, Boris Karloff, to see Boris Karloff and just, to, I mean, one of the tops as far as being able to emote without saying anything, you know, saying so much with his eyes and his, his persona. Um, it's just, uh, that's, that's something that a lot of actors don't have. Uh, the original um, Lon Chaney had that. Oh, right. Know? Uh, to be able to say so much without words is just, it's such a gift. And to be able to work with that and witness that would be, especially if you got to maybe do a makeup on somebody and have them emote through that. Like that's like that Frankenstein makeup is heavy duty. There's a lot going on there, but he, the care, the actor still completely comes out hundred percent, you know? Absolutely. Wow. Those are great choices. <laughs> great picks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hey, so what are you working? What's your what are you working on now? What's your I know we're, we're right during COVID, but what's your what are you working on? What do you hope to work on in the future? What do you, what do you have? What are your future plans? Um, we have uh, we have a bunch of stuff. We have this um, movie. Uh, we actually opened up a new studio in North Hollywood here, so um, that's been going good as much as it can during a pandemic. Um, this new film, Death of Me, that we did with Darren Lynn Bowsman of the Saw film fame, um, that's on Netflix now. We did some really cool, creepy, uh, melted face women for that. Um, and uh, we have this film, The Deep Ones. It's an HP Lovecraft film that we did all the effects for. That's making the festival rounds right now, and that'll be coming out soon. We did with Chad Farron, who's a great filmmaker. And then we did the show called The Core, which was like, a, we take you behind the scenes and show you how effects are done on different budget levels. And it's on Shudder. And I, I co-produced, I'm a co-host on it. And the main host, Mickey Keating, who's a super talented filmmaker, we did his new film, uh, Off Season. And that's premiering this year at South by Southwest. And that's a super, super creepy film. So I can't wait for everybody to see that too. Um, so there's, and then Josh Gates Tonight, uh, that's a, an Explorer show on the Discovery Channel. And we've done some really cool stuff with him. And we have something really cool coming up in April on Josh Gates Tonight, where we got to recreate a very iconic horror character. So I can't wait for everybody to see that. And, um, and then we have Glenn Danzig's new movie, Death Rider, in the House of Vampires. Uh, the first only spaghetti Western vampire movie directed by Glenn Danzig. Um, and we did all the makeup effects for that. And uh, that's a very intense one too. So that's coming out later this year. So you've been really busy. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, a lot of these are things that we shot in 2019, 2020, and they're just now starting to come out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff kicking around. I have a lot of other like film projects. There's a new feature that I'm pitching. Um, there's an anthology horror uh, series that I'm a part of that we're working on right now. So there's a lot of irons in the fire, you know. Great. And your studio is in Burbank? Uh, North Hollywood. North Hollywood. North Hollywood. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And, and then um, and we have uh, and then my my feature film Strange Nature is on Amazon Prime now, so you can see that and uh, yeah, and it's on Tubi now too. Wow. Great. Great. Uh, if somebody wants to reach out to you or, or have you worked on their film, that's what's the best way to get a hold of you or see your work. Um, the best way would be to, uh, you can go to our website, which is ojulafx.com and um, all of our links and everything are there and you know, there's a reel and all the photos, but then also our Instagram is probably more up to date, which is at ojulafx. Um, there's a lot of great stuff on there. I follow so, you. Yeah. I like your, I like all your posts. You're very funny. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Always something fun going on. Jim, thank oh. you for making this a fantastic filmmakers forum. Uh, and, and your support of Kapow over the years has been very much appreciated. And I'm looking forward to work with you very near in the future. All right. Thank you. All right. Appreciate so, it. Sure. All right, take care.